In this chapter, we are going to discuss the hypothesis testing for multiple population proportions, independence, and goodness of fit. First of all, let's look at the test for the equality of three or more population proportions. In previous chapters, we looked at the scenarios in which we are testing one or two population proportions. And here, we are going to look at the scenarios we have three or more population proportions. Let's look at the hypothesis first. The null hypothesis will be that all the proportions are equal. The alternative hypothesis is not all population proportions are equal. That is to say, as long as there is at least one equal size that doesn't hold, we then can conclude that the alternative hypothesis is true. Of course, here we are going to look at the case with three or more proportions. Let's look at one example. J.D. Power uses the proportion of earners likely to repurchase a particular vehicle as an indication of customer loyalty for the automobile. An automobile with a greater portion of owners likely to repurchase is concluded to have greater customer loyalty. Suppose that in a particular study, we want to compare the customer loyalty for three automobiles, Chevy Impala, Ford Fusion, and Honda Accord. The current owners of each of the three automobiles form the three populations for the study. So let P1, P2, and P3 be the proportions likely to repurchase Impala, Fusion, and Accord for their respective populations. And then the hypothesis will be looking like this. Now hypothesis P1 equals P2 equals P3. Alternative hypothesis not all population proportions are equal. To test the above hypothesis, we first take a sample of earners from each of the three populations. Let's assume that the sampling result is summarized in the following table. These results are typically called the observed frequencies. Let's take a look. In total, we have received responses from 500 automobile owners, out of which 312 are saying they are likely to repurchase. That means the remaining 180A are less likely or unlikely to repurchase. Out of those 500 automobile owners, 125 of them on Impala, 200 of them on Fusion, and the remaining 175 of them are accord. Of all the impact owners responded to the survey, 69 of them are saying they are likely to repurchase, and the remaining 56 of them are unlikely to repurchase. Out of the 200 fusion owners, 120 of them are saying they are likely to repurchase and 80 of them are saying they are unlikely to repurchase. Of all the Accord owners responded to the survey, 123 of them are saying they are likely to repurchase, and the remaining 52 of them are saying they are unlikely to repurchase. In the next step, we are going to calculate the expected frequencies under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. First of all, out of the 500 vehicle owners responded to the survey, 312 of them are saying they are likely to repurchase. That is to say, 62.4% of owners in a sample are likely to repurchase. If the null hypothesis is true, then we can say that there should be 62.4% of Impala fusion and Accord owners respectively who are likely to repurchase. So 
to compute the expected frequencies, we do the following. For example, the expected number of input owners who are likely to repurchase is going to be equal to 62.4 percent times 125, which is equal to 78. The expected number of input owners who are unlikely to repurchase will be equal to 125 minus 78, which is 47, etc., etc. And in this table, we summarize the expected frequencies under the assumption that H0 is true. Let's take a look at this expected frequency table. First of all, I'd like to remind you that all the totals remain to be the same. For example, overall 500 automobile owners, out of which 312 are likely to repurchase, 188 are unlikely to repurchase. And the number of Impala owners, Fusion owners, and Accord owners remain to be the same. 125, 200, and 175. And those six numbers give us the expected frequencies. For example, suppose that H0 is true, then we expect it to see 78 out of 125 input owners are likely to repurchase. Remaining 47 of them are unlikely to repurchase. Similarly, out of the 200 fusion owners, 124.8 of them are likely to repurchase, and the remaining 75.2 of them are unlikely to repurchase. The way we compute the expected frequencies under the assumption that H0 is true can be summarized with this formula. Once we have the expected frequencies, we are ready to compute chi-square test statistic. The chi-square test statistic can be calculated with this formula. Essentially, we are going to compute the difference between observed and expected frequencies and square it and then divide it by the expected frequency and sum all of them up and then we get the chi-square test statistic. The degree of freedom of this chi-square test statistic is equal to the number of population proportions k minus 1 and you may wonder why k minus 1 if you take a look at our null hypothesis, we have P1 equals P2 equals P3, but as long as we know P1 is equal to P2 and P2 is equal to P3, we can conclude immediately that P1 is also equal to P3. As a result, the degree of freedom is only 2. In general, that is going to be k minus 1 degrees of freedom. And the rule of thumb over here is that the expected frequency should be 5 or more for each of the possible scenarios. Next, let's compute some numbers with our IPython notebook. First, let's import chi-square from scipy.stats package. And here, we put the observed and expected frequencies in two lists. And here, we are computing the chi-square statistic. In this case, I'm using a for loop to do that. And in the future, I'm going to use list comprehension. And this for loop takes care of the summation. And as you can see over here, the chi-square statistic is the sum of the squared difference between observed frequency and expected frequency divided by the expected frequency. Let's say in this case, alpha, the significance level is 5%, and we know that degree of freedom is 2, so we can compute the critical chi-square value just like this. We call the PPF function, which is the inverse CDF function for chi-square, and similarly, we can compute the p-value associated with our tests. In the end, let's print out our result. It turns out that 
The chi-square test statistic is equal to 7.89, and the critical chi-square value is 5.99. And from here, we can tell already that we should reject our null hypothesis and conclude that not all population proportions are equal. Why? Because the test statistic is greater than the critical value, and this is a upper-tailed test. And similarly, we can check the p-value, which is about 1.93%, less than the significance level of 5%. Either way, we draw the same conclusion. And later on, I'm going to explain why this is an upper-tailed test. Sometimes, people also call that right-tailed test. Next, let's summarize the procedures for testing the equality of three or more population proportions. First, of course, we are going to identify our null and alternative hypotheses. And next, we are going to conduct random sampling to generate the observed frequencies. And then in step 3, based on the assumption that null hypothesis is true, we are going to compute the expected frequencies. And then in step 4, we are going to calculate the chi-square test statistic. Once we have that, we are ready to draw some conclusions. Just like what we discussed in the previous chapters, we have two ways of drawing conclusions. One is based on the p-value, the other is based on the critical value. If we use p-value approach, we are going to reject the null hypothesis if p-value is less than or equal to our significance level alpha. Alternatively, if we use critical value approach, we reject H0 if the test statistic is greater than or equal to the critical value. And once again, uh, in this case, the degree of freedom is equal to k minus 1. Now let's take a look why this chi-square test for equal population proportions will always be an upper tail test. Let's take a slightly deeper look. Suppose H0 is true, then the difference between the observed frequencies and the expected frequencies will be relatively small. As a result, the chi-square test statistic will be relatively small as well. On the other hand, if H0 is false, then we expect that the difference between observed and expected frequencies will be relatively large. As a result, the chi-square test statistic will be relatively large as well. That's why a chi-square test for equal population proportions will always be an upper tail test or right tail test. Let's conclude this video with some remarks. In our example, we are essentially testing whether this hypothesis is true. That is, the conditional probability a customer will repurchase given he or she is an implant owner is equal to the conditional probability that a fusion owner will be likely to repurchase and that will be equal to the conditional probability that an accord owner will be likely to repurchase. If this hypothesis is true, we can then conclude that the customer loyalty for automobiles is independent of the brands, at least as far as Impala, Fusion, and Accord are concerned. As a result, chi-square test can also be used to test whether two categorical variables are independent. In this case, we are essentially testing whether customer loyalty is independent of the brand of the automobiles. In one of the following videos, we are going to officially discuss the hypothesis test for the independence between two categorical variables.